I am Bernard Herschel. Before my retirement, I was the chief of HIV AIDS at the Geneva University Hospital. You might call me an AIDS dinosaur who has followed the HIV epidemic from the very first cases in the early 1980s through the triumph of antiretroviral therapies unequaled in the annals of medicine. Of course, this triumph has its flip side. Younger colleagues are no longer familiar with the opportunistic diseases and their myriad manifestations. Hence, the idea of these videos. After a short introduction, they will feature a series of images illustrating one or several exemplary cases from my files. Here is a list of the most common symptoms of the acute retroviral syndrome. ARS. Fever, lethargy and fatigue, rash, myalgia, headache and pharyngitis are observed in more than 50% of patients. None of these are specific. A practitioner would have to see hundreds of cases of pharyngitis, for instance, before discovering a case of ARS. Now let's look at the rash in some detail. Here are two photographs of the typical rash of primary HIV infection. Note the maculopapular rosella-like lesions involving the face, the neck, the trunk, more than the extremities. However, palms and mucosal surfaces may be involved. Another photograph of the rash of primary HIV infection. The rash in this case of PHI was diffuse and possibly sun-induced. However, note the macules on the right arm. Rash of primary HIV infection. Note the typical distribution more marked on trunk and face than on extremities. Three close-up photographs of the rash of primary HIV infection. The acute retroviral syndrome, ARS, may involve virtually any organ system. Frequently seen, although less common than fever and rash, are involvement of the digestive system with diarrhea and abdominal pain, of the oral cavity, candidiasis, erosions, ulcers, cough with sometimes pulmonary infiltrates, photophobia and meningitis, and genital ulcers. Many of these are illustrated in the case studies that follow. PHI involves the GI tract, starting with ulcers in the oral cavity. In this case, there were multiple painful superficial ulcers associated with enanthema of the heart palate, below right, in a case of primary HIV infection. Two painful genital ulcers observed during primary HIV infection. The pain distinguishes these ulcers from syphilis because syphilitic chancre is usually painless. A 35-year-old woman presented with headaches and rash 17 days after sex with a new partner. Note the elevated number of leukocytes in the cerebrospinal fluid, evidence for meningitis, and elevated transaminase evidence of hepatitis. On September 30th, the Western blot had only one line, which is an indeterminate result, and the first generation ELISA antibody test was negative. However, the P24 antigen was already positive. On subsequent dates, October 7th, November 27th, January 15th, more and more bands appeared in the Western blot, 
the ELISA test turned positive, while the P24 antigen, as well as all the symptoms, disappeared. We lost track of this patient for some 10 years, but in 1996, she had herpes zoster. The next patient is a 76 years old man with suspected pneumonia. He is a retired musician and teacher. The past medical history includes hypertension and psoriasis. In June 2005, he had acute hepatitis B, and in January 2006, he had fever, fatigue, a dry cough. He was treated with amoxicillin clavulanic acid, but continued febrile to 38.6, complained of increasing dyspnea, and was finally admitted for workup on January 13, 2007. The PA chest X-ray showed cardiomegaly, but is otherwise uninformative. However, the lateral chest X-ray revealed a retrocardiac infiltrate indicative of pneumonia. After this chest X-ray and suspicion of pneumonia, clarithromycin was added to the antibiotic regimen. But until January 16th, the fever did not abate. A urinary test for Legionella was negative. A discrete rash was noted. And the question of an allergy to the beta-lactam antibiotics that he had received was raised. Additional history, however, revealed that he had had a homosexual contact on December 31st and had a negative rapid HIV test on January 8th. The rash as it appeared on January 17th, 2006. Here are the results of laboratory testing for HIV. As mentioned, all tests were negative on January 8th. But on January 17, the fourth generation lab test was positive the P24 antigen was present at more than 3,000 picograms per ml, and the HIV RNA was astronomically elevated at more than 50 million copies per ml. The patient was treated with highly active antiretroviral therapy. Antibiotics were discontinued, and all signs and symptoms rapidly disappeared. The next patient was a 30-year-old known to be HIV negative in January 2005, but with multiple sexual exposures. So when he complained of fever and fatigue in October 2005, primary HIV infection was suspected. And confirmed by laboratory tests, a negative third generation test, but positive fourth generation test, with extremely elevated levels of P24 antigen and HIV RNA. Note that in 2005, heart was not deemed to be indicated because the symptoms of PHI disappear spontaneously. However, instead of feeling better, this patient felt worse and he was re-evaluated five weeks later on November 30th. As expected, his P24 antigen had disappeared, the HIV RNA had declined, the CD4 count had improved, but he was extremely fatigued and un unable to work. His blood count was puzzling, with an increase in lymphocytes from a subnormal 781, lymphopenia is typical for PHI, to more than 8,000, with CD8 lymphocytes predominating. While we were still scratching our heads in search of an explanation, somebody remembered an old paper describing two IV drug users with a mononucleosis-like syndrome with pharyngitis and enlarged lymph nodes, excessive lymphocytosis of more than 8,000, a positive P24 antigen but no HIV antibodies, and isolated IgM anti-CMV antibodies. 
The authors hypothesized that these two patients had been co-infected by HIV and CMV. Hypothesis confirmed by a small series in a subsequent paper with the title Lymphocytosis in primary HIV infection is associated with CMV co-infection. And here are the results from our patient. He zero converted for CMV with both IgG and IgM antibodies absent on October 25, but present on November 30. In addition, he had moderate CMV viremia on November 30th. In conclusion, this was indeed a case of HIV-CMV co-infection with characteristic extreme lymphocytosis. Both these infections are transmitted sexually, so it's not surprising that they travel together. The patient was put on heart and slowly improved. A blood count was normal one month later and the CMV viremia had disappeared. Experimental infections with the simian immunodeficiency virus, simian human hybrid viruses, and human patients with biopsies have shown the importance of the lymphoid tissue associated with the GI tract for early infection. Some 10 to 20% of patients with PHI have oral ulcers, and while usually an apparent involvement of the entire GI tract is possible, with diarrhea and abdominal pain frequently observed. The next patient illustrates involvement of the gastrointestinal tract during PHI. It was a 42-year-old gay man vaccinated against hepatitis A and B. In February 2007, he had a negative HIV test. On April 1st, 2007, he had a sexual contact. On April 25, he complained of severe pain on swallowing and starting April 27, he had diarrhea. He was treated with ampicillin, developed facial edema and hospitalized for suspective anaphylaxis. In view of the symptoms, the negative HIV screening test in February and the positive test in May, the massively elevated P24 antigen and HIV viremia and the depressed CD4 count, the diagnosis of primary HIV infection was established. Hepatitis was also evident with transaminases at more than 10 times the upper limit of normal and elevated serum bilirubin. In conclusion, this was a case of PHI with hepatitis. However, on May 6, the patient was found unconscious with quote unquote no blood pressure due to a massive bleed per rectum. This graph illustrates the massive fall in hemoglobin concentrations from May 4th to May 6th due to the bleed. The contrast enhanced CT on the left and the angiography on the right show active bleeding in the ascending colon. Two views of the ulcer in the ascending colon, which was the probable origin of the hemorrhage. The ulcer was cauterized and the bleeding did not recur. The patient started heart and made an uneventful recovery. Finally, a tragic case where one suspected diagnosis hit another, similar to what the signs say at every train's crossing in France. In January 2016, a 70-year-old man with no notable medical history presented at a tropical disease clinic a few days after returning from a two-week family vacation in Cuba with complaints of fever and diffuse myalgia. 
A discreet maculopapular rash was present on his arms, legs and trunk. Considering the history, infection with the Zika virus, dengue fever or rickettsiosis were considered likely. The patient was sent home with a prescription for doxycycline. All laboratory results came back negative. The skin rash disappeared completely within two weeks. About six weeks later, the patient had a profound loss of vision within a few days. Fundoscopic examination revealed bilateral edema of the optic discs. The patient's optic disc is on the left, note the hemorrhage, compared to a normal optic disc on the right. The diagnosis of optic neuritis was confirmed by MRI. Note the peripheral enhancement of the optic nerves compared to a normal control on the right. Fluorescein angiography of the retina did not show any vascular disease, leakage or obstruction. Multiple infectious causes such as CMV, varicella zoster, herpes simplex virus type 1, toxoplasmosis, Lyme disease, cat scratch disease, syphilis, Epstein-Barr virus and tuberculosis were also excluded, as were multiple autoimmune diseases. And finally, last but not least, HIV. The ELISA and Western blot were positive with high viremia, but conserved CD4 cells. Looking back to January, with the help of stored samples, negative ELISA and Western blot, but very high viremia, establishing the diagnosis of acute retroviral syndrome. The patient was treated with high-dose steroids and highly active antiretroviral therapy. The HIV viremia disappeared, but the patient did not recuperate vision and remains blind six years later. We have found four similar cases in the literature. Would immediate treatment with heart in January 2016 have averted the tragic outcome? We'll never know, but it seems likely. Thank you for watching. I'd be grateful for any feedback. A companion video is available in this chain explaining the limits of laboratory tests during the early phases of HIV infection. If you are interested in other videos about opportunistic diseases in AIDS, please subscribe.